Einen wunderschönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums. Zu unserer Reihe Lecture in Film und tatsächlich neun Monate haben wir uns jetzt schon mit Ernst Lubitsch, hier sehen wir ihn in Kostüm und Maske, <lacht> beschäftigt. Es ist tatsächlich eine große, große Gelegenheit, immer wieder sich so über so einen langen Zeitraum auch mit so einer Person der Filmgeschichte auseinandersetzen zu können. Etwas, wo wir erfahren haben auch, dass das gar nicht so oft mehr passiert. Obwohl wir gerade 125. Geburtstag von Lubitsch gefeiert haben, 70. Todestag steht in diesem Jahr noch bevor und trotzdem gerade in Deutschland einer, der viel zu wenig beachtet ist. Und umso toller, dass wir so wunderbare Partner an der Seite hatten, gerade mit der Goethe-Universität im Institut für Theater, Film und Medien, Wissenschaft. Marc Siegel und Rembert Hüser sind heute hier, die haben diese Reihe ausgerichtet, all diese Referenten eingeladen. Großartigen Applaus nochmal an euch, bitte. Und das geht natürlich auch nicht ohne unsere Unterstützer. Das Exzellenzcluster Normative Orders ermöglicht, dass sie freien Eintritt bekommen. Ähm, dass äh, die Hessische Film- und Medienakademie, Anja Henningsmeier ist heute auch hier, ähm, ermöglicht das. Also es ist ganz toll, hier in Frankfurt solche Partner zu haben. Wie immer gibt es einen Vortrag vorweg, ähm, weit gereist heute. Wir freuen uns sehr darauf, Christine Korte. Sie wird nachher sprechen über Meier aus Berlin. Auch das ist vielleicht sehr, sehr spannend und passt auch zu dieser Situation von Lubitsch, die ich beschrieben habe habe. Dieser Film war lange als Fragment nur erhalten in der deutschen Fassung und dann ist etwas geschehen, was uns natürlich sehr freut. Ein findiger Archivar hatte in den Niederlanden eine Kopie entdeckt, die hieß Sally geht auf Reisen und dann festgestellt, das ist ja der gleiche Film. <lacht> Dementsprechend werden wir heute eine Kopie sehen, die die Originallänge hat, die niederländische Zwischentitel hat. Das kann man zwar sich erahnen, wir haben aber uns die Mühe gemacht, trotzdem das noch deutsch zu untertiteln. Auch das wird ganz schön sein, eine 35 mm Kopie. Und wie so oft ist da halt auch kein fester Ort, wo diese Kopien alle gelagert werden. Es gibt kein Lubitsch-Zentrum in Europa zum Beispiel. Ja, diese Reihe hat auch vieles ermöglicht, worüber man noch weiter nachdenken kann. Ich denke, gerade auch die Diskussion heute, danach dem Film, soll noch mal so ein bisschen Fazit ziehen. Was haben wir über Lubitsch gelernt? Wir haben gehört, ganz am Anfang von, von Rembert Hüser, der Lubitsch-Touch ist Quatsch, war eine seiner Thesen. Und wir haben es dekonstruiert und wieder neu zusammengesetzt. Und ich glaube, für, wer jetzt bei vielen dieser 15 Veranstaltungen war, der weiß, worauf es ankommt warum Lubitsch ein so großartiger, gerade Komödienregisseur war. Ja, es sei auch noch darauf hingewiesen, dass wir wie immer ein Begleitprogramm haben. Das widmet sich noch Greta Garbo in diesem Monat, weil wir Ninochka am Anfang des Monats gezeigt haben. Das heißt, Sie können am Samstag die Kameliendame in Originalfassung sehen und dann noch den großen Klassiker Mata Hari, alles auf 35 mm. Und Gun with the Wind hat aber mit Lubitsch nichts zu tun. <lacht> aber das ist ein guter Hinweis auf jeden Fall. Unsere Technicolor-Reihe sei jedem ans Herz gelegt, die in diesem Monat auch stattfindet. Ja, ich möchte nicht mehr viel Vorrede vorwegstellen, sondern bitte jetzt zunächst auf die Bühne Marc Siegel und dann Christine Korte. Viel Vergnügen. Dankeschön. Um, ja, wir... An der Goethe-Universität möchte ich uns auch bei dir, liebe Urs Spuri, bedanken und auch bei dem Filmmuseum um, für diese Zusammenarbeit. Es ist wunderbar, dass wir an der Uni die Gelegenheit haben, um, in der Öffentlichkeit uns zeigen zu dürfen und <lacht> einen Austausch, um, in, im Austausch mit Ihnen zu kommen über die Themen, mit denen wir uns um, uh, jeden Tag auseinandersetzen. So das finde ich insbesondere sehr anregend in, diese, um, in diesem Kontext, im, im Kontext dieser Reihen, die dann fortgesetzt um, werden sollen. Um, danke, Urs. Um, und jetzt um, werde ich ins Englische wechseln, obwohl unser Gast heute Abend doch um, Deutsch beherrscht. Um, vielleicht, weil ich Deutsch nicht beherrsche, dann... <lacht> <lacht> um, ja, naja, okay. I'm very happy that Christina Korte has agreed to take on Lubitsch for us today. It's a new subject for her. Although the context of Lubitsch's early work, uh, namely the Berlin Volksbühne in its early years, is a subject that she's been researching for some time now. She's currently a doctoral candidate 
in communication and culture at York University in Toronto. And as far as I understand it, es ist etwas anderes als Kommunikationswissenschaft, wie man das hier macht, eher Medienwissenschaft mit starker Cultural Studies Einflüsse für diejenigen, die sich dafür interessieren. But um, her dissertation, um, and that is the reason why I wanted to invite her um, today to talk, her, her dissertation is an institutional ethnography of the Berliner Volksbühne. And what that, as far as I can tell, what um, part of what is driving her interest is to um, articulate the, the ebbs and flows of concepts like dynamism and energy in the context of um, the Berliner Volksbühne from Max Reinhardt in its early days all the way through Kastorf today. I guess the energy dies with Der Kahn. Um, sorry, ich Berliner. Um, Witz. She's published some articles from this work touching on issues of transgression, neo-totalitarianism in Frank Hasdorf's theater and um, in other essays on Orientalism in the work of Christoph Schlingensief and also um, an interesting um, essay on manifestos by Henrik Ibsen and the role of the manifesto in Ibsen's work. Chris was recently a research fellow, a visiting scholar actually, at the University of California in Berkeley. And she was previously a DAAD researcher in the American Studies Department in Mainz. And I should add that when I, I, I don't have to, but I would like to add that when I first met Chris, um, she had just completed a long stint performing with those great innovators of European theater, Wegard Winge and Ida Müller, in their infamous Wildente production at the Bergen Festival. She is an atypical scholar, one who doesn't only talk and write about stuff, but she does it too. And I'm looking forward to hear what she's going to do tonight. Please join me in welcoming Christine Korte. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, I should say, uh, Lubitsch is new to me, but uh, I'm now a Lubitsch lover. So um, in tonight's screening of Ernst Lubitsch's 1919 silent comedy, Maya aus Berlin, a lebenslustige Berliner, stifled by his marriage and petit bourgeois convention, flees Berlin Schöneberg for the revitalizing Bavarian Alps. Lubitsch's performance of the brash and unlikely ladies' man, Sally Meyer, turns the trope of Teutonic masculinity on its head and parodies the fantasy of the adventurous German mountaineer. But this escapist comedy, a frothy, fun-filled vehicle for Lubitsch's comedic talents, is, in fact, a more complex cultural artifact than it might initially appear. Maya aus Berlin is a film that obscures the stakes of escapist fantasy against the backdrop of the loss of the war, the German Revolution, the traumatic birth of the Weimar Republic, and anti-Semitic nationalism emerging in their wake. It also demonstrates Lubitsch's indebtedness to his theatrical training under director Max Reinhardt, whose iconic production of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream was known for its sensual and immersive depiction of nature. Reinhardt was by far the most important theater director in Europe in the early part of the 20th century, and his influence on the expressionist cinema of the 1920s has been well established by film historian Lotte Eisner. Lesser known is that for three years during the First World War, he also served as artistic director of the Berliner Volksbühne. Founded in 1890 as a ticket subscriber-based organization for Berlin workers, the Volksbühne's mandate was to give workers access to socially critical and educational theater. Reinhardt's fantastical theatrical spectacles would be received by the more left-wing faction of the Volksbühne as a betrayal of its aims. 
However, Reinhardt's artistic directorship of the Volksbühne during World War I and his staging of classics such as Shakespeare and Schiller uh, are evidence of the overwhelmingly positive reception of his work by the working class. Throughout much of the, of the First World War, Lubitsch was going from film work during the day to playing small parts on the Volksbühne stage for a working class audience in Reinhardt's productions at night. This confluence of events inspires a consideration of how the experience of performing for a socially marginal, marginal milieu for an audience of real workers who were unschooled in bourgeois convention might have affected the development of Lubitsch's style and comedic tropes. What happens if we consider Lubitsch and preamble tonight's screening of Maya aus Berlin with the Volksbühne and Max Reinhardt in mind? What light can the politics and stylistic preferences of the historic Volksbühne shed on the early development of Lubitsch's comic style? And what does this film about a frolic in the Alps, a film about nature, fantasy, identity, and masculinity, stand to benefit from Volksbühne historiography and Reinhardt's tenure therein? To answer these questions, I would like to first provide some historical context about the Volksbühne's beginnings in the naturalism movement and its relationship between art and politics along bourgeois and socialist lines. I would then like to focus on what Max Reinhardt's style represented for the idea of people's theatre more broadly, with the example of his iconic production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. My concluding comments on tonight's film perceive Lubitsch's work as a comedic deconstruction of the Reinhardtian fantasy of German nature and romantic spectacle. What we know today as the Volksbühne at Rosa Luxemburg Platz, the theater at the center of a recent controversy around artistic director Frank Kastorf's departure, is in fact the product of a workers' theater movement, the Freie Volksbühne, established in 1890. The momentum for establishing such an institution was first born in the 1880s from a left-wing bourgeois literary circle, which loosely included future director Otto Brahm, critic Bruno Wille, and playwright Gerhard Hauptmann. These men would meet regularly at Hauptmann's writing retreat house on the outskirts of Berlin to discuss plays of the new naturalism movement, such as Emile Zola's Therese Raquin, La Terre, or Ibsen's Ghosts. Key to the historic Volksbühne and future controversies is understanding its subversive and radical beginnings. The movement was, from its inception, both an artistic and political organization with members who had strong ties to the Social Democratic Party. Otto von Bismarck, who had successfully united Germany as a nation state, saw no greater threat to his Prussian-led hegemonic rule than the rising socialists. He implemented a special law in 1878 against tendencies in the socialist movement that constituted a threat to public order. This law enabled the police to disband socialist organizations and confiscate literature. Socialists no longer had the right of public assembly. However, contrary to Bismarck's agenda, these laws and the conditions of illegality and suppression only strengthened socialism in Germany. Otto Brahm, the, the future artistic director of the Deutsches Theater and the mentor of Max Reinhardt, founded the Freie Bühne in 1889, which served as the model for the future Freie Volksbühne. The, this members-only organization was established to get around censorship laws and stage new naturalist works. The Freie Bühne would rent theaters and organize performances of new natural, naturalist plays, opening with a production of Ibsen's Ghosts, directed by Brahm. Important here is Brahm's mantra for truth on stage. With its scientific determinism, psychological realism, and subjects such as poverty, incest, alcoholism, and venereal disease, the new naturalism movement was a radical departure from the opulent court theater and was intent on reflecting the conditions of the working class with documentary-like fidelity. But while Brahms' Freie Bühne broke barriers of subject matter and style, it did not break barriers of social class or affordability. 
Around the same time, union-led worker education initiatives were also mobilizing around this new wave of socially critical drama. Such politicized reading groups represented a working class increasingly desirous of access to bourgeois high culture. But they were also interested in the development of class conscious and proletarian works of art that reflected their worldview. Three members of such a group approached Brahms' colleague, Bruno Wille, with the idea of find, founding a Freie Volks, Volksbühne. This would be a ticket subscribers organization identical to the Freie Bühne in its programming mandate, but accessible to the workers' budget. Wille's idealist agenda was to give workers who had migrated en masse to Berlin in the late 19th century access to good quality and progressive theater to steer workers away from entertainment venues, which he saw as a debasing effect of capitalism and consumerism on the human spirit. The programming lineup would include naturalism as well as classical plays for educational and moral purposes. But the Freie Volksbühne's founding motto, Die Kunst dem Volke, art for the people, would be vigorously contested. Does it encompass the entire folk? A classless national community that transcended social, ethnic, and religious divisions? Or imply only the proletariat, the rising class, and purveyor of class-conscious theater? The first production of the Freie Volksbühne was Ibsen's Pillars of Society in 1890, followed by Hauptmann's Vor Sonnenaufgang. Importantly, the lifting of the anti-socialist laws by the Kaiser that same year did not stop police suppression of suspected socialist organizations, even though the Freie Volksbühne would officially profess political neutrality. Police, um, the Prussian police regularly bullied the organization and interrupted performances. In fact, the first major schism dividing the Volksbühne movement into two factions already in 1892 was the result of a more of more left-leaning members' criticism of Villa's willingness to capitulate to the state police by dropping his lecture series, which the police claimed was spreading socialist propaganda. Villa and his faction were then forced to leave the organization, establishing the Neue Freie Volksbühne. The Marxist literary critic Franz Mehring then took over the Freie Volksbühne, Mehring represented the left-wing faction of the movement, which preferred classical productions of the bourgeoisie when they were still a rising revolutionary class. Theater that indicted corrupt powers such as Schiller's Die Reube and Lessing's Emilia Galotti. According to Mehring, politicizing the classics was vastly prefer preferable to naturalism, which was merely titillating for the bourgeoisie as they peered into working class milieus an early instance of poverty porn. Where this Volksbühne history connects us to Lubitsch is in 1904, when Reinhardt takes over the Deutsches Theater from Bram. Reinhardt changed that theater's direction fundamentally from naturalism to neo-romanticism. He was also a director who understood the spirit of the times and recognize the desire of the working classes to participate in bourgeois culture. As such, he set, sought to develop his own people's theater, and so was eager to accommodate accessible tickets for the Volksbühne organizations. All Sunday afternoon matinees at the Deutsches Theater were allotted to Bruno Villa's Neue Freie Volksbühne. So, However loftily one would like to speak of workers' preference for socially critical and class-conscious drama, evidence shows that most preferred Reinhardt's spectacular and vanguard approach to the classics over the bleak outlook of naturalism or political didacticism. It was, in fact, because of Reinhardt's productions that the Neue Freie Volksbühne's membership exploded this inspired the two warring fa Volksbühne factions to unite as one theater and create a permanent ensemble. The location for the new Volksbühne on what was then called the Bülowplatz, today Rosa Luxemburg Platz, or that's where it was, sorry, it was, was uh, at the Bülowplatz and today at the Rosa Luxemburg Platz. This was the heart of Berlin-Ost between Mitte and Prenzlauer Berg 
a working class neighborhood that was a world apart from the West Berlin bourgeois establishment. It was also known as Die Scheunenviertel and saw the overcrowded tenement housing of the Lumpenproletariat next to the Ostjuden ghetto in the Grenadierstrasse. Small shops such as the Lubitsch family tailoring business next to an emerging world of consumer capitalism. The characters that inhabited these class and ethnically inscribed spatial boundaries would not only provide fodder for Lubitsch's milieu comedies, set in the confection, the Jewish garment industry, but would also inspire artists such as the Wilhelmine illustrator Heinrich Zille, who both affectionately and with brutal honesty caricatured the proletarians of Berlin O. In this working class milieu, the neoclassical facade of the new Volksbühne building stood out as pompous and aspirational. It was very much a temple to the ideal of a humanist classical education. Mehring saw the organization's task as preparing workers for the coming proletarian revolution, not financing a theater. But it is significant that for the first time in history, an audience of workers had funded and owned their own theater building. However, with the Social Democrats' official support of World War I, things again came to a head in the Volksbühne. Many members joined the Spartacus League, which contested an imperialist capitalist war. These bitter divisions on the German left would play out in the Volksbühne movement just when the new building was set to open. Given these tense circumstances, there could be no more controversial choice than to invite Max Reinhard, who had just signed a manifesto supporting the war, to act as artistic director of the new Volksbühne Theater for a three-year period. It was a mutually beneficial appointment, since the Volksbühne had recently lost half of its members to the military, and Reinhardt's own plans to create his own people's theater, a theater of 5,000, had to be put on hold until after the war's end. Reinhardt's popularity guaranteed the Volksbühne an audience, ensuring its survival during a difficult period but also garnered accusations of selling out, of replacing sober politics with spectacle, escapism, and commercialism. The Viennese-born Reinhard was a discovery of Otto Brahm, and from 1894 to 1902, he worked under Brahm at the Deutsches Theater, establishing a reputation as an actor that specialized in portraying old men, a recurring character in naturalist theater. However, Reinhardt soon tired of naturalism, finding it gray and depressing. In 1901, he founded the cabaret Schall und Rauch, co-founded it, which amongst chanson, humor, and grotesquerie presented playful attacks of naturalism's heavy moralism, as well as one-act parodies of Brahms' productions. Reinhardt's style represents a departure from the bleak, determinist, psychological world of naturalism into a world of spectacle and theatricality, from dour social realism to beauty, lyricism, and mysticism. His theater is an iteration of the idea of a people's theater that breaks out of didacticism and politics and into enchantment and dream. For Reinhardt, Theater's medium-specific domain, made possible through new stage technologies, was to fil facilitate fantasy and transcendence. As artistic director, Reinhard was given free reign at the New Volksbühne and in return became responsible, became responsible for the repertoire. The Volksbühne became part of the ever-expanding Reinhard theater empire, and for many, the organization had lost its political character. Yet Reinhardt's productions initiated workers into a new world of aesthetic modernism and provided highly accessible and vastly entertaining adaptations of the classics. These productions also gave workers the opportunity to see the greatest actors of the day on stage, including Victor Arnold, Lubitsch's acting teacher and mentor, whom he described as, and I quote, one of the greatest Shakespearean clowns, as well as future stars of Lubitsch's historical dramas, Emil Janings, 
Paul Wegener, and Edward von Winterstein. Importantly, the Volksbühne was a testing ground for Reinhardt, as it would be for the young actor Lubitsch, to work in front of a naive audience whose reactions were unrestrained and unschooled in bourgeois theatrical convention. We will see this lack of bourgeois refinement comically displayed in Lubitsch's character, Sally Meyer, in tonight's film. Nowhere was theater's unique domain over fantasy and enchantment more explicitly thematized than in Reinhardt's legendary production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, which premiered at the Neues Theater in 1905 and remained in his repertoire until 1939, so over 30 years. As a teenager in the audience, Lubitsch had been a keen observer of Victor Arnold's portrayal of Thisbe. And later, in the Volksbühne stagings of Reinhardt's dream, Lubitsch himself would play the small role of Snout, the tinker. Images of the production show an impressionistic, painterly quality to Reinhardt's sets, and incidental music by romantic composer Felix Mendelssohn was also inserted into the drama. Reinhardt, de Reinhardt deployed all the technical advancements and tricks that modern theater had to offer including the Volksbühne's rotating stage, emphasizing the magic of the new stagecraft. As such, in the difficult years during the war, the Volksbühne moved away from politics and into facilitating escape and pleasure, which were at the core of Reinhardt's theatrical principles. I'll quote uh, Reinhardt. Was mir vorschwebt, ist ein Theater, das den Menschen wieder Freude gibt, das sie aus der grauen Alltagsmisere über sich selbst hinausführt, in eine heitere und reine Luft der Schönheit. Ich fühle es, wie es die Menschen satt haben, im Theater immer wieder das eigene Elend wiederzufinden und wie sie sich nach helleren Farben und einem erhöhten Leben sehnen. What we see in Reinhardt's production of A Midsummer Night's Dream is a desire to facilitate transcendence and an escape from the confines of daily life into the sublime beauty and regenerative power of nature. Rather than being apolitical, we can interpret Reinhardt's agenda as a democratization of pleasure. Up until then, the domain of the Wilhelmine bourgeois elites, now emancipated for the people. However, this experience of pleasure in the theater was not only for the benefit of spectators. As a, as a former actor himself, Reinhardt's theatrical principles were, to a large extent, devised for actors tired of playing depressing parts. Reinhardt's approach represented the liberating power of physicality and play for actors, releasing them from psychology and social environment and foregrounding the actor's unique physical qualities. This approach allowed Lubitsch, who experienced angst about his shorter stature and ethnic appearance, to deftly cultivate the mask of Sally. In a way that anticipates Lubitsch's own brand of physical comedy, Reinhardt took stylistic and choreographic cues from the medieval people's theater, from the comic stock characters and mask types of the Commedia dell'arte and pantomime. Reinhardt explains his approach to acting thusly. The theater owes the actor his, his right to show himself from all sides, to be active in many directions, to display his joy in playful, playfulness, in the magic of transformation. I know the playful creative powers of the actor and am often sorely tempted to save something of the old Commedia dell'arte in our over-disciplined age to give the actor, from time to time, an opportunity to improvise and let himself go. This release from an over-disciplined age and the actor's own pleasure in the physicality of the performance and the individual agency afforded by mask is, I think, nowhere more clearly on display than in Lubitsch's own performance as Sally in tonight's film. Reinhardt's scenography for A Midsummer Night's Dream was three-dimensional and seemingly alive, replete with birch trees and brush. The rotating stage facilitated the transition from the Athenian square into nature 
and was aided by using fresh moss, which overwhelmed spectators with an enchanting fragrance that transported them into the woods. According to Reinhard, nature, and more specifically the forest, is the real protagonist. Der Wald spielt mit. Der Wald ist die Hauptperson. Er ist der Held dieser Sommernacht. Der Wald mit all seinen Urlautend, mit seinem Urwesen, mit dem Chorus all seiner Treibkräfte und Keime. What Reinhardt created was an overwhelmingly sensual and immersive experience of nature that transcended the division between stage and audience. The spectators stepped out of their own social situation and entered a different experience of space and time. Reinhardt's production of A Midsummer Night's Dream suspended the idea of theater as a moral and political institution and embraced the irrational, amoral, Dionysian powers of nature. Reinhardt's Gesamtkunstwerk, his reliance on lighting, mood, choreography, masses of extras, and spectacular stagecraft, anticipates Expressionism, as well as the communist theater of Erwin Piscator at the Volksbühne in the 1920s, which deconstructed and politicized many of his principles. Reinhardt's theater was a theater for das Volk, but not quite the way the founders of the Volksbühne understood the idea, and certainly not the way more politicized members did. What Reinhardt's work ultimately represents is people's theater as classless festival theater. According to Erika Fischer-Lichte, this correlates with the rising nationalism of the time. By her account, the experience of a temporary theater community created around a unique aura and ritualistic atmosphere of Reinhardt's theater collapsed the boundary between individual and collective and elite and popular culture. Reinhardt's productions, as events in liminal space and time, temporarily created a community that transcended the social divisions and tensions in Wilhelmine society, letting off steam and fostering social cohesion for a rising 20th century nationalism. Lubitsch spent nearly seven years performing in Reinhardt's ensemble from 1911 to 1918, with three of those years on the Volksbühne stage. Lubitsch was clearly marked by Reinhardt as both actor and director. Notable parallels between the two include the overarching importance of pleasure and play in their oeuvres, comedic types and stock characters, a love of theatricality, and the actor as well as richly detailed mise-en-scenes. Film historian Lotte Eisner thought Lubitsch less sensitive to Reinhardt's influence than other filmmakers, while Siegfried Krakauer, on the other hand, saw him as a true disciple of Max Reinhardt. Tonight's film clearly takes important cues from Reinhardt, and more specifically from his theatrical principles displayed in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Much in the way that Reinhardt's theater represents the move from naturalism's bleak milieus into the whimsy and escapism of neo-romanticism, so too does Lubitsch's portrayal of Sally Meyer represent a breaking free from one's domestic confines into nature and hopefully a bit of moral license. At the start of the film, Sally is constrained by his domestic domestic surroundings, and especially by his doting but jealous wife, Paula. Sally writes a letter to his doctor, urgently requesting a tapetenwechsel, a change of scenery. <laughs> Otherwise, his marriage will be in trouble. Already here, we see Sally playing different roles with slapstick virtuosity, that of a measles-ridden convalescent, and the fearless knight he represents to his wife, which will be comically undermined for the rest of the film. Hamming it up for the spectator, Sally conspires with the doctor and then the maid to keep up the charade, exposing his true self to both as a spirited and lustful trickster. Once the desired alpine, <laughs> once the desired holiday in the Alps is prescribed, Sally dons the folk costume of a Tyrolean mountaineer. 
This getup is so comically out of place that it inspires onlookers to ask whether he is going to a costume ball or whether he will be performing on stage and children chase after him on the street. Not only does the film foreground theatricality, but also the carnivalesque spirit of making a fool of oneself. Sally's costume is also the spectator's first indication of Sally's misperception of appropriate attire and codes. Building on the earlier milieu comedy Shu Palast Pinkus from 1916, Sally is a figure who has risen from lowly shoe salesman into successful petit bourgeois Schöneberger. But he hasn't refined his style, nor has he lost his aggressiveness, using trickery, for example, to get to the front of the train line. Seen through a theater historiographical lens, Sally's train trip from Berlin Friedrichstrasse S-Bahn to the Tyrolean Alps already seems like a comic take on the Reinhardtian inheritance. Sally's own escape from the grim domestic uh, from the grim domestic milieus of naturalism and realism into the sensual and liminal realm of festival time. Coded as both Berliner and as Jewish or ethnic other, with distinctive hand gestures and quick retorts, Sally cuts a colorful and charming figure when compared to the drab bourgeois Gentiles, and so it is no wonder the female characters in the film are so receptive to him. He charms his way into the ladies' cabin on the train from Berlin to Bavaria, and during his stay at the Alpine Resort, the enchanting but betrothed Miss Kitty immediately accepts his company. His authentic responses, irrepre irrepressible joie de vivre, and delusional role as Frauenheld serves her, Miss Kitty, as both comic relief and a breath of fresh air. Despite his unrelentless pursuit of her, Miss Kitty finds Sally charming and harmless and obviously vastly preferable to the high society types vying for her attention. But while women do tend to see Sally's ultimately good-natured charm, his escapist holiday has both class and ethnically inscribed limits. During his first dinner reception at the hotel and still wearing his over-the-top getup, Sally pushes his way into a place at the table. Frustrated that high society is ignoring him, he stands up, clinks his glass, shouts for attention, and then politely introduces himself, affecting a comedic contrast. He also elbows his way in front of the other men vying for Miss Kitty's attention, demanding his right to be a contender. Ultimately, it is this right to have access to the bourgeois ritual of marital transgression, this exotic dalliance, that is primarily what is at stake here for Sally. In fact, Sally makes it clear that he isn't all that impressed with Tyrol, except for the feminine nature he admires in his hotel maid. Devoid of the refinement to pretend he likes it, Sally flagrantly describes the Alpine village as komische Gegend, the waiters at the hotel restaurant too slow, and the food better at Aschinger's in Berlin. Prior to his trip, he gets his geography confused and later mistakes the iconic mountain der Watzmann for a local businessman from his Keats. Sally believes it is his right to access the luxury and high society that capitalist success affords him, but displays a defiant and comical ignorance of bourgeois convention. Thus, Sally is at once the parvenu and social climber as comic type, and a figure who shows the real struggles of ethnic Jews in Germany to assimilate. Films such as Meyer aus Berlin, as well as Schupalast Pinkos, are referred to as Jewish milieu comedies. The depiction of an ethnic milieu in Wilhelmine, Germany, replete with its caricatured social types and presented from an insider's perspective, was a form of social critique, and in this case, a distinctive, a distinctive brand of self-effacing Jewish humor. Sally has arrived in terms of financial success, but as this film shows, access to the bourgeois establishment is not easy for German Jews despite rhetorical claims to the contrary. 
According to Valerie Weinstein, Lubitsch's use of humor and stereotypes is not about reinforcing the barriers between dominant and, and marginal groups. Rather, it underscores the inconsistencies of these barriers and highlights incongruities in the conception of German Jews as successfully assimilated. At the same time, Sally's inappropriate behavior and carnivalesque attire show that belonging is coded by performance, by the individual's gestus and habitus. Sally's role as a comic figure, on the one hand, adheres to certain Jewish and even anti-Semitic stereotypes, but also satirizes the rig rigidity and contradictions of the bourgeois establishment, and therefore the humor is also at their expense. Sally's escapist fantasy also shows up a gendered angst that resonates more broadly with a German masculinity in crisis after the loss of the war. Here, the Reinhardtian dream of escape has turned into a nightmare the evening before the dreaded mountain climb. Sally, however, has a chat with Der Watzmann, leading comically to the removal of a few thousand meters of its height. Sally's successful mountain climb the following day, albeit, albeit with many comical foibles, serves as a kind of sexual and social wish fulfillment. Miss Kitty selects him as her trusted companion, and symbolically they climb the Watzmann together. In this liminal fantasy space, Sally does become a knightly protector of a Gentile woman and the int intrepid conqueror of the Watzmann, all the while turning these tropes of Teutonic masculinity on their head. At the film's conclusion, the kind of alpine frolic that Sally had and we had in mind remains officially unconsummated. However, Lubitsch's delightfully wicked point here is that fresh air, nature as code for sexual transgression, is a good and necessary thing for a marriage. And in the film's climactic scene in the Mountain Lodge, Sally, Miss Kitty, and their respective partners all end up unwittingly in a kind of foursome. No natural symbol other than the forest characterized the romantic sublime of German nature in the collective imaginary as much as the mountain Der Watzmann. Der Watzmann, clearly in cheeky Lubitsch fashion, doubles as a woman to be conquered and hence is also a fantasy space for a kind of healthy German masculinity. From the romantic imaginary of Kaspar David Friedrichs der Watzmann to the Wandervogel and Lebensreform movements, the mountain and the mountain hike played into a renewed interest in Teutonic myth and later into vitalism theories trending in nationalist circles in the early 20th century. These discourses were not uniformly anti-Semitic, but they were increasingly so, especially in 1919, and certainly anti-cosmopolitan. Not coincidentally, Lubitsch satirizes these myths as mere pretense for marital transgression and contradictory bourgeois mores. By showing up the contradictions of the bourgeoisie, of the bourgeoisie explicitly, Lubitsch is deconstructing a fantasy that ultranationalists and eventually the national socialists would use for a notion of Germanness that would exclude German Jews. Sally's social transgressions allowed audiences to escape into a beautiful alpine vacation and simultaneously laugh at real social tensions while the bloody German revolution was raging behind the screens in 1919. Crucially, Lubitsch seems to intuitively understand the medium-specific possibilities of cinema to use nature, enchantment, and myth for a nationalist agenda. Lubitsch's film uses the Alpine frolic to give us a complex reading of the social and domestic politics of nature and fantasy without compromising the central lesson he learned from Max Reinhardt's approach to theater, pleasure. Maya aus Berlin returns us to an iteration of people's theater that would emancipate and liberate fantasy and play, which is precisely what Lubitsch brings to the screen. However, this film also shows the possibilities of early silent cinema to use comedy as critique to mock 
precisely the politics of a bourgeois romantic fantasy of nature, and as such to mark the limits of national community at a crucial moment for German Jews. As with, I believe, almost everything in life, this ties back to the historical Volksbühne in a way that vivifies many of its key tensions, which Lubitsch seems to have usurped as, this, as the domain um, of the new medium of cinema, appealing to both a marginalized demographic and to the masses, the struggle for access to elite bourgeois culture, and crucially, the question of who constitutes das Volk. Lubitsch also recognized the ability of cinema to disrupt narrative closure through the audience's identification with the outsider, with those excluded from the dominant established order. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Christine Korte, für diesen spannenden Vortrag. Vom Mitsommernachtstraum zu Sally Meyer gleich. Ja, wir haben jetzt noch zehn Minuten Umbaupause. Sie können sich noch mit einem passenden Getränk ausstatten, ähm, sonstige Orte noch aufsuchen. Wir signalisieren dann mit einem Gong, dass es weitergeht. Bis gleich. Hans Lubitsch, Oberg. Großen Applaus. Vielleicht als allererstes noch zwei Fragen kurz an dich, bevor wir gleich wieder mit Christine und Marc weiter diskutieren. Hast du die holländische Version schon mal gesehen? Weil das ist ja äh, komplett viragiert, das hat, so kannte ich ihn noch nicht jedenfalls. Nee, ich habe ähm, <lacht> sorry, ich habe eine schwarz-weiße gesehen, eine deutsche mit englischen Untertiteln. Ich habe die mir auf YouTube angeschaut. Und du hast jetzt natürlich... Es waren natürlich so ein paar Szenen, die waren da nicht drin, also die waren hier noch zusätzlich drin, ja. Und du hast jetzt natürlich wieder improvisiert, für alle, die dich zum ersten Mal erlebt haben. Ich habe improvisiert, wobei ich so ein paar Jazz-Standards ähm, oder so ein paar Stücke aus dem Jazz-Repertoire mit reingebaut habe. Und als Überleitung jetzt zum Ende unserer Reihe, was macht, du begleitest sehr, sehr viele Stummfilme, was macht Lubitsch so besonders? Ach, die Geschwindigkeit, das Tempo und die Albernheit, dieser schöne Quatsch, den er macht. 99 Jahre ist das her und der ist schon so frisch. Also nochmal großen Dank, dass du dabei warst bei dieser ganzen Reihe und heute Abend. Uwe Oberg nochmal, komm gut nach Hause. Und jetzt begrüßen Sie nochmal Christine Korte und Marc Siegel zu unserer Abschlussdiskussion. Ja, kann man auch nochmal klatschen, Ein toller Vortrag. Danke euch. Christine. Um, in, in the film, Lubitsch says um, or, uh, he plays Sally Meyer from Schönenberg, which I thought was interesting because in, if I remember correctly, in Schumpinkus, um, Pala, uh, Schumpinkus, Schumpalas Pinkus, Schum that yeah. was it, he, um, it, it's set more in his milieu, in the yes. milieu right near the Volksbühne, right. whereas yeah, here he's already, so, so is there, can you talk, to, uh, talk about this, is he, is he already ridiculing is there a kind of internal jewish um um critique here going on of the schöneberg jews i don't know so much about the schöneberg jews but certainly i think um he's taken that uh ostjudische uh, gestus mm -hmm. with him into schöneberg and he he hasn't yet learned um the refinement of mm -hmm. um of, uh, yeah, of, of the bourgeois, uh, gentile establishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, did he, do you, know, uh, do you know about his roles that he would play um, on the stage? Did he, like, refine this Jewish character through um through stage performance or was was this a completely different kind of performance that he was doing in film you know what i don't know um whether he did um specifically jewish characters in the cabarets one of his iconic characters um he did with reinhardt um, the hunchback in sumerun mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. he was also kind of perfecting also in the cabarets and then that becomes a film but in terms of the jewishness um 
I don't know if that would have been mm-hmm. one of the the masks that he was. I'm sure it was one of the many masks he was playing mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. But I think in historical hindsight, it becomes the most interesting mm-hmm. because of history. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if in that moment, mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting mm-hmm. to read back now, yeah, yeah. but with caution that that you know there's so much playfulness with mm-hmm. this with these ethnic tropes um that uh yeah i don't know to what extent i mean he really was a very assimilated german jew and that ostjude maske was something that uh, clearly gave him so much freedom and delight mm-hmm. to play mm-hmm. with in mm-hmm. this but uh and that came from observation from his from his milieu but mm-hmm. uh he didn't grow up didn't grow up with that. So yeah, training, observation, the Reinhardtian uh, influence, I think that, uh, and then it, like he, you know, he did have that anxiety about the way he looked. So this was mm-hmm. a way to liberate that. And mm-hmm, that's really mm-hmm. extraordinary, I think, that mm-hmm. he felt that he could kind of reclaim that for his comedy. And that's, that's the genius of Reinhardt is everybody has their own kind of physicality. Mm-hmm. And where can you take that as a social type, which is sociological too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I found that that one of the um, really enlightening things in your talk was this strong connection to Reinhardt. And, and I started having since we're at the end of the series, I started having a lot of Lubitsch films flashing through my head and, and the trying to think about the relationship to nature, because mm. that was something that I thought you brought out so nicely. Yeah. In this kind of take the tram 11 from Friedrichstrasse to straight into Tyrol right which at the beginning he thinks is Switzerland Uh he seems at least a little confused about about where he's going and we don't know if he got on the wrong train or what happened Mm -hmm, in his mm -hmm. kind of uh, antics but uh but yeah I mean that uh and I mean it's hard it's also hard to read back he's he's in equal measure a Berliner and and a cosmopolitan Mm -hmm. and the solidarities that he's creating in the film Mm -hmm. like the you know he's equally mystified by the Bavarian Mm -hmm. you know who's inscrutable to him and then he meets the Landsmann from Berlin and there's his solidarity right there so you know there's complex Mm -hmm. social solidarities uh, at work, which I also find find so interesting, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and uh, and the Berliner is ostensibly all kind of completely uh, not in touch with. Na- and those Van der Vogel movements were actually from Steglitz. I think they started the mm-hmm. Berliner mm-hmm. anyway. So yeah, so he's very much a cosmopolitan. Mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe we could open it up to some comments. I think Sie können Rennenberg auch gerne auf Deutsch natürlich fragen. Ah ja, Sie können auch um, Ihre Sprache sprechen. <laughs> no, I'm confused. So I'll I'll try it in English. <laughs> so um, um, what I liked very much about your talk was that you um, that you told both a proletarian history and a Jewish history, and um, in a way you mixed you mixed the two. And your talk was also about neighborhoods when you were talking about the Scheunenviertel. So. Um, uh, what interests me is what uh, what actors do at that time. So especially, uh, I forgot the uh, the number of years that um, uh, Lubitsch was at the um, Volksbühne. Was it about seven years or something? It was he was well, only when uh, when um, he, only when Reinhard was there, and Reinhard was only there from 1915 to 1918. So okay, three so years so on the Volksbühne so stage. Three years. But it's and it. Um, um, it picks up a little bit on what what uh, Mark was asking. So on the one hand, from from what I've read, and there's there are only very few um, uh, documents, and you you added so much new information that I find really thrilling, is that um, uh, Lubitsch played on Jewish theaters, and the Sally was a stock character on Jewish theaters. So so I was I was also wondering now how this um, this combination of a kind of a, um, of a decisively left proletarian character with with some of the stars of the Jewish um, uh, um, um, theaters at the same time it must must have, must have been much smaller theaters in the neighborhood perhaps mm-hmm. at the Scheunenviertel. Mm-hmm. but a was it possible for an, for an actor and you 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 also emphasized he did this in the morning he did this in the evening so he, he uh, so there were always he was pretty much working on 
several levels and um, I never saw so much the proletarian aspect of his figures, uh, I never saw it as much as tonight, So um, because it's really a, a strange hybrid figure. So he's mm -hmm. de definitely a very marked, he has a marked body, so there are all these jokes about um, meet, meeting a Landsmann when uh, once you, uh, uh, once uh, one get their Nase nach, so it's all about these Jewish cliches and stereotypes that are around, and he has a nose, and so it's this. Um, the thing he acts on the one hand, he acts as uh, 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 this kind of this racist stereotypes. On the other hand, he's also in. Um, he he's acting like uh, like the typical prole of uh, also, and I and this mix is really interesting. But um, other collaborations, um, so it's not a mere proletarian theater, but it's is other collaborations between different types of theaters. So it's. Uh, do you happen to know anything about it? Because I don't. Um, no, I just think it's. Um, <sighs> You know, what I find interesting is just the kinds of solidarities that were um, formed at that moment. And the Scheunenviertel really crystallizes them, and they do overlap. So even Heinrich Zille, um, and who else was working in that, in that moment and in that terrain, I haven't done enough research on that, but I want to. Um, and... You know, there isn't. There's also the outsider type emerging in general, and cinema is a really unique medium for this. And I think there's a kind of, um, yeah. I mean, the the cabaret is already the space for this kind of epic commentary. This is what the milieu humor is doing. It's already a kind of epic, socially critical commentary on dominant culture. So that spans the proletarian, that spans the Jewish, that spans the queer. Um, and I think at that moment, particularly in Wil Wilhelmine, Germany, that these solidarities are crossing and aligning in different ways. But I don't think that's yet enough been coaxed into relief. And correlating with that also the kinds of, what were the different kinds of physicalities that intersected both? And that's why I think this is a really unique example because he was, the Volksbühne at that time was really extraordinary because audiences, if they didn't like something, so they say people, they would throw things, they would show that they were bored, uh, women would wear hats in the theater, um, they really didn't know the conventions. So, um, so I think that that's an important quelle, or was an important quelle for, for Lubitsch. Um, but in terms of whether the Jewish theater milieu and the proletarian theater milieu, I would be interested to know how much there were kind of um, competing allegiances for a particular actor. I don't know enough about it, but I'm going to look more into it. Yeah. Welche Rolle spielt denn für Sie, dass Lubitsch als Schauspieler anfängt? Ist das Christine? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that he's that he started as an actor. Well, same with Reinhardt, right? I mean, that is key to what he's doing. The, he would, I mean, he's an actor's director, and uh, and again, it's this gaze. It's looking. It's precisely this kind of sociological gaze that comes from the milieu and that looks for social types that the cabarets are really honing in reaction to the dominance, the ubiquity, the towering father figure of Otto Brahm. I mean, Otto Brahm was really controlling everything at that time. So then you had these subversive milieus aligning with these, with other underdogs, and training in this kind of cultivating mass commedia, all of that. And then Reinhardt tells them, Reinhardt is really the one that encourages them to take that vision to a gesamt Kunstwerk, literally, you know, to become a director, that step, Reinhardt was really the first, I think, of that, of that ilk, and then I think Lubitsch follows suit. Um, so yeah, it's, these are actors that play, that create their own masks, um, and then it becomes a logical extension of creative agency, I think, for them. And, uh, and then that continues on, his, he's a ge he was a genius with actors understood types, understood people, and that's where the humor comes in, right? It's, it's humor we all recognize, it's universal humor. 
Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I have to ask again <laughs> uh, about the proletarian character of uh, or, uh, of Sally, because I mean, when he's at home, it doesn't look proletarian. No, and he's not. A and he has a yeah. maid at home. He yes. can afford the right. same hotel. Yes. Um. Uh, so it's more in terms of behavior than in terms of exactly. Social. That's right. And and so and what I'm saying exactly, I'm not saying he's a proletarian. Um, firstly, that naturalist theater was um, was the theater of the working classes, and it extends into realism. So you have petit bourgeois milieus in the genre. So that is crucial for me that he's starting out in the confines of this petit bourgeois milieu, but he's totally taking the piss out of it, right? Like it's it's just all play, and he's you know I think it's really referencing that kind of realist sonography, and then he needs the tapete and vexa. Um, it's not proletarian, but what's important and interesting for me is that he got his training, um, at, and he didn't grow up as a proletarian. I mean, he grew up also the son of, of small business people on the Schönhauser Allee. I mean, they weren't poor, but they lived in this milieu with um, a, very close to the Ostjuden ghetto and very close to the um, Lumpenproletariat. So... What, you know, what is the, um, what kinds of gestos and social type and reactions is he getting every night from that theater? And how is he sensitive to marginalization along class lines? And that to me is really, um, really comes to the fore here. And, and uh, there's still limits that he has in terms of um, his own gestos and habitus. I mean, he's pretty, he's not a... a proletariat but he's you know he was a shoe seller and he's moved his way up but he's still you know so it's yeah I in fact what I one of the things I had to cut I wanted to write about is um I don't know if anybody else saw this but to me he really presages um the secret life of Walter Mitty as a type and Ferris Bueller's day off so he's actually going to show a clip of, do, do you, have you seen uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Do you see this, the type and the great escape, the fantasy? I mean, Walter Mitty especially, but it's really, um, and faking sick. Like the first, if you watch the first scene of Ferris Bueller's Day Off and the way he deconstructs his strategy of duping his mother and father and then taking the whole day free, it is so indebted to this film and to Lubitsch and the Lubitsch brand of comedy. So you really see an interesting afterlife of this type and this. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, I just thought no. I'd jump in here too. I mean, I find this, the combination that we're talking about, the, the proletariat, what you mentioned, the queer, um, but also, I don't know, maybe thoughts about nationhood, for example, or making yeah. fun of what the concept of nation is. Yeah. It reminded me in so many places of Bergkatze, um, and I was just wondering what you think about, because I think it's easy to say, for example, okay, it's absurd to get this strange kiss on the hand or when you're sitting at a dinner table that it takes forever for the server to get around to you. But then what I find so surprising, what makes it so f funny, I think, is that, um, it's, he then turns that or, or makes some move that not only deconstructs it, but also shows, I don't know, its absurdity. So what is that? Yeah. I mean, what are there theories about what, what that is? Because it's one thing to say, yes, okay, nationhood and sexuality and class and all of these things are problematic and absurd and constructs and things like this. But it's another, it's, it's something else what yeah. he's doing there. I don't know, I don't know what to call it. Yeah, and it's dangerous to read it from what we know, what happens after 1922, when in fact, you know, I didn't include this because I was like, it's not relevant, but Adolf Hitler, you know, sets up shop, right? At, right in the Watzmann, uh, the Kirstein House is right there. I mean, this site gets so usurped and tainted by National Socialism. Um, and, you know, it's not, as I, I, I tried to emphasize, it's much more the subtle humor, like the subtle, ridiculous, petty power struggles about Mitredefähigkeit. Who has the power to speak to who? And Sally is just as guilty of turning around and being like, you know, du darfst nicht mitreden because you're from Plauen and you haven't 
climbed the Watzmann yet. So it's really, I mean, the, you can take the implications of this, and I really do think, uh, I really stand by, because Reinhardt was, was, Reinhardt made a whole kind of concurrent project out of making fun of Otto Brahm as the towering father figure. Reinhard way usurped Brahm and became just ubiquitous. So I think there's a lot of legitimate reason for saying he's kind of taking the piss out of Reinhard. Um, but I don't think we should read too much into it. But um, I do think he's definitely playing with that romantic tropes and imaginary. And at the same time, um, what Lubitsch is most interested in is is the subtle, ridiculous power plays and um, pettiness and ridiculousness of of people. But there's still room for him to also kind of look particularly at the bourgeoisie, and that's that's an, another important place to go back and look at at proletarian theater and the attack on the bourgeoisie, or the cabarets and the attack on the bourgeoisie, and that's really the place to, I think, understand the way he's attacking nationalism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even just the struggles within the Social Democratic Party, there's a lot, you can look at the humor around this moment in politics and the Social Democrats' iteration of nationalism or Max Reinhardt's iteration of nationalism. So this stuff was kind of common parlance in theater at the time. And the Volksbühne is this amazing site for these debates about, I mean, that was, that was the reason, one of the main reasons why he, it was so controversial to invite Max Reinhardt because he was a cons considered a nationalist already in 1914 and the workers did not want him to come. So this kind of humor is really there, maybe just not from the lens we look at it now, from, from different very concrete social democratic politics at that moment. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, that's a comment here. Okay, it does. That's super interesting what you're saying, Christine. I'm just Both. enjoying getting this, this context that we haven't really worked out um, throughout the course of the series, so it's fantastic. Yeah, please. A, a very different question, but I was just wondering about um, genre. Um, I'm I'm thinking of Horvath and uh, Die Bergbahn and like shorter prose pieces by Horvath. Uh, but now I realize there's a whole tradition of parody of mountaineering and like you know that the whole kind of adventure uh, parody um, even earlier than that. Uh, can you do you have other examples uh, that you could think of? I don't. This is new for me. This is bringing what I know about um, Volksbühne and uh, and social democratic politics and uh, yeah, but um, and romanticism and all of that. Um, so wait. So say more precisely. The question is whether I know any more instances of this kind of parody of the mountain genre. Is that? Yeah, if if there are other contemporary examples. Contemporary uh, examples? Yeah, I mean in the in the twenties. The twenties. Let me think about that. I'll see if I can think of anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was also thinking about the genres because uh, it's really interesting to see. I just uh, watched it up that the back film started at the beginning of the twenties, but it was kind of like you told uh, the Nazis could use this um, this language the the, the pictures are so amazing and it fits perfectly into the national socialistic yeah. propaganda in a way and before uh, I thought this was Lubitsch is doing is kind of a parody but the, if the parody is before yeah. it's not a parody anymore no 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 and I mean there was good reason to be parodying this already yeah and what's really interesting is Walter Benjamin in 1939 is already is has all of this anxiety again about Reinhardt and his ritual theater, and this being turned into a film, Ma the um, Midsummer Night's Dream as a film for Walter Benjamin is kind of like the paradigmatic uh, fairy tale like immersive enchantment 
fascist nationalist piece of cinema. And here we have somebody that is completely, completely taking the piss out of that um, in a really extraordinary way. And really, and you already see, you see here the outsider as a figure that's able to disrupt that closed narrative that this genre tends to come with. No genre is kind of more closed. Um, and then you have this this troublemaker, a tr and he really, I should have said, you know, watching the movie again, he is, he's also, I mean, this film is so rich. He's also so much a trickster. He's so much, a, the body, the food, the beginning, the rizinus, the castor oil. I mean, it's all like that, you know, um, scatological and physical, and he's insatiable, and uh, it's, he's really this archetype to a T in a in a very interesting way. And of course, he's the liminal too. Also, the the speed. That's I, I don't quite know what to do with it. But I mean, Uva mentioned his speed, but I think the tempo. But also, um, Kalani's comment about this this um, that moment at the table, this performance style that he has where where he like initiates a gesture and action, but then he is so f quick that he's already commenting on it sort of as you're processing it somehow, yeah. like with that crazy face that he um, takes on um, when he's just the whole time kind of like mm -hmm. this big smile mm -hmm. um, so that there, there's there's, there's, I, I don't know. It's a kind of performance style that, that, um, it's not. It, 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 <laughs> it like establishes a gesture. It interrupts a situation. It, it's a kind of physicality that then, um, then is so proud of its own gesture or something that it becomes this kind of critical reflection on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's, there's some, but it, it happens so quick, so that you're not. You're getting two, in a sense, two gestures for the price of one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mean like he's <laughs> um, rupturing, like he's setting up the dramaturgy for yes, to I'm interrupt and then like right away you get the reflexive meta cinematic, I just did this or you mean like that? Or? Yeah, yeah, or not, I'm not even thinking cinematic, I'm thinking more like bodily and theatrical, the mm -hmm. physical comedy, mm -hmm, the kind mm -hmm. of physical comedy. It seems mm -hmm. like it's a different physical comedy than Chaplin, mm -hmm. you know, or then, um, I don't know, other slap, I don't know. I have to think through, like think of Lubitsch in relation to other slapstick. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to understand what is it? Is it? It's both like situation is funny and unusual, but it's also. I mean, also the 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 dialogue, the text. There's there's the the um, intertitles. There's other there's humor there, but um, but sometimes that that comes a little too slow. Even like he's yeah. already somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that, that seems almost to hold him back sometimes, these intertitles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, but it's his physicality that is doing more than one thing at a time. Right. Like it's, it's hard to keep up with, yes. with that. That's really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but um, that's a great point. Mm, I don't know. Mm. No, that's great. <laughs> I, like, I love it. I think maybe it's the first film of Lubitsch where the intertitles are completely just into dialogue and without any describing at all. And he is going on with that. And But it, I think it's maybe the first experiment when it's uh, over the whole hour of film we, we have here. We only have Sally in Tirol, but all the other others, uh, other intertitles are really dialogue and trying to get on with the humor he wants and then to the, And then the, the letters that, yeah. that are often, of course, often used. Yeah. And then, of course, the thing, I mean, when I was glancing the literature on this, um, so and I didn't mention it, but uh, I don't know, maybe there's some comments on this. The famous, of course, the, the shoe fetish, right? Which is mm -hmm. comes from uh, his time in the working in the shoe business and then the whole you know, sexual fetish thing. And I don't know. I didn't, yeah, wasn't my the domain of my talk, so I didn't speak about it, but I don't know if... Or if talk anybody about has, it, talk about no, it. No, I've got nothing to say about it. I say everything I have to say, okay. but I'm wondering if anybody has anything to say about that or anything else that they thought. What is like Tarantino avant la lettre or something? Yeah. <laughs> well, I hate, I can't believe I compared someone so wonderful to Tarantino, but... Neither. <laughs> um, oh my God. Yeah, well... Um, we don't have to force this discussion. Well, what, what exactly? This has been a wonderful um, nine months of discussions. And it's kind of, I think this talk tonight has showed us that there's uh, part of what I think Rembert Hooser and I were really interested in in this series 
was to try to get people like you with specialties in other areas um, to come and talk about Lubitsch and open up his films and the subject matter, the, the performance style, the history of them in new ways for us. And so I think it's wonderful to end the series um, on, on, on such a rich um, historical talk that shows us how, how much more historical work we need to do in order to, to better place his work, his performances, and the kind of origins of the style that then later um, went to Hollywood and investigated other milieus. Um, in, in a very, but with a very similar attention to physicality and to masks and and also to um, perverse um, mm. sexual capers, like yes. the wonderful, as you pointed out, the foursome, oh, the, the, foursome. the yawning oh, yeah. foursome. Yeah, they go there. There's no, I mean, we go there. That's the, the genius, it's erotic right? erotic yawning at the end totally. of the film, yeah. Totally. Maybe uh, I would have a very last question like, as a kind of conclusion of that. Oh, I thought we, I just did that. We talked, yeah, because <laughs> I, I know, I know, <laughs> okay. but I had one. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, as we talked so much about the Lubitsch touch as it's not existing, and it's something <laughs> that is more than that and without Lubitsch, and I would like to ask all three of you, so Rembert is included in this question, um, what are you thinking, we have deconstructed the Lubitsch touch, what do we have now? What is the point where we can go on right now? What makes Lubitsch so special that so many comedian uh, directors yeah, are in, in influenced by? Christina, maybe first. You know what? I d so I'm so new to Lubitsch, but, um, but the Lubitsch touch intuitively for me, um, you know, I... I just scanning the literature on the so-called Lubitsch touch, it just had no interest for me. I'm so much, I mean, to, like really this is, for me, the work to do is historical, it's dramaturgical, it's tempo, it's situating all of this within, within the context, but also giving him as a historical f figure freedom to uh, just, I mean, he was so interested in pleasure and play and, um, to kind of, I don't know, the touch, what, yeah, I guess, I don't know as a heuristic tool what it would really, uh, what it would bring. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any lasting words of, or final words on what, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is it, what, you know. Um, you don't have to go there. I don't, yeah, maybe I just won't go there. No, I mean, but he's just, um, there's just so much whimsy and play and brilliance in his understanding, his understanding of a tight milieu, a tight dramaturgy, a tight relationship, and where it plays into larger structures and discourses. And he just, it's the timing. Um, but I don't think it's a, a like this touch thing. I don't know. So that's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have to say that, I mean, the, the Lubitsch touch sort of kept me away from Lubitsch for so many years. <laughs> um, this, this idea of the Lubitsch touch, because it just sounded like something, a kind of filmmaking that wouldn't interest me, um, that was too um, um, sophisticated and, sent and, and delicate and um, um, not too intrusive, not too bodily, not too fast, um, not schnell wie der Witz. Um, the title of this series, but and and so so for me, one of the the joys of the series and part of why I really enjoyed Rembert's kind of um, provocative um, um, Einstieg um, at the beginning to get us to to really th move away from the Lubitsch touch idea, is that 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 um, I think on the one hand was based on discussions of his American comedies. It didn't take in the breadth of his work, and now we see. Um, I mean, the, the terms that you've just used, tempo and, I don't know, corporality and other, mm. that, that there's so much more to his work. So, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I would hope that this humble um, lecture and film series could help generate more substantial thinking about Lubitsch that could get beyond a kind of branding that um, that is... Yeah, misleading and um, does harm, I think, to um, to the great innovation of what mm -hmm. what um, the breadth of his work has to offer. 
I do not have <coughs> much to add to this. For me, is um, the problem is always that you, um, um, if if you operate with something like the Lubitsch touch or with uh, <laughs> however you want to translate it, and here's a here's a handchen for a situation, or he's so. Um, it's it's always then you cut any discussions short. So it's it's just um, and and you s you s said it very correctly. We have to do uh, way more precise readings of this instead of in the end always going to the uh, Meisterwerke Scheiße and, uh, and 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 the and the big genius who is in control of everything, who has big ideas, and all of a sudden all we see is Lubitsch, 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 and I'm. And this cuts, uh, this takes so much away from the energy of these films. So it's a very conservative discussion. Uh, it's, a, it's a typical way of canon formation. So it's very tautological. Lubitsch is Lubitsch because he is Lubitsch. And uh, and you have, um, if you if you look, Christine Thompson has uh, has, uh, has has spelled out how how people have tried to define uh, the Lubitsch touch since Paramount also used it uh, for uh, for advertising as films. So she came up, uh, she was completely bored, and she said, uh, these are uh, 25 uh, ways of how to define the Lubitsch Dutch. Uh, nothing is interesting. And we, we still, we go on and we go on, and it's Lubitsch, and it Lubitsch is Lubitsch is Lubitsch. Mm, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ein großartiges Schlusswort an dieser Stelle. Ich sage ganz herzlichen Dank nochmal, Christine, für diesen ja, tollen Vortrag ja, ja. und Ihnen allen, dass Sie neun Monate durchgehalten haben. Stummfilme, Tonfilme, Ernst Lubitsch, Marc siegel Rembert, das hat eine große Freude gemacht. Danke Großen dir, Applaus. Urs. Vielen Dankeschön. Dank. Und das schicke ich natürlich noch hinterher. Die Lecture, the Lecture Goes On, Must Go On. Im Oktober wird es mit dem Thema Tropical Underground weitergehen, was ganz anderes. Wir gehen nach Südamerika, Lateinamerika, 60er, 70er Jahre meistens. Das wird ganz spannend, ähm, ganz viele tolle Gäste auch dann. Ich freue mich, dass es dann weitergeht. Ja, ja es wird um, so ein Bruch in, in der Reihe, insofern, dass es nicht nur über ein einzige Auteur geht, sondern dass es geht um ähm, eigentlich die radikale Innovation im brasilianischen Kino ähm, äh, in den 60er und 70er Jahren, vornehmlich Verbindungen zwischen Avantgarde-Bewegungen, Underground-Bewegungen und Anthropologie. Ähm, so es ist eine, eine Widerstandskino, ein oppositionelles Kino, ein unglaublich freche, freches Kino, so ein so mit wunderbaren Filmen wie Hitler of the Third World und The Red Light Bandit. Um, so sehr, sehr spannend und nicht uh, und Filme, die auch wie diese Lubitsch-Filme nicht so oft zu sehen sind. So wir hoffen, um, dass wir ihnen hier auch um, sehen können. Genau. <lacht> Einen schönen Sommer und im Oktober sehen wir uns zur Lecture ja, wieder. Danke. Nochmal Dankeschön und guten Nachhauseweg. Tschüss. <lacht>